I'll begin reading in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, and I'll read all of these Beatitudes through 512. Seeing the crowds, uh, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing to, to think about how uh, the simple act of looking forward to seeing someone or seeing something, that act of looking ahead can have a tremendous impact on our present experience. Uh, it, will, it will shape our thoughts and shape our, uh, our behaviors. It'll shape our motivation sometimes. Uh, I just learned this week about a, a buddy of mine, who, who, a, a brother pastor, who for three years saved, he and his family saved so that they could go to Disney, what's the one in Orlando? Um, World, I guess everybody knows it. Uh, they, they, uh, they changed their lifestyle. They said no to things they had been saying yes to. Uh, they canceled other family trips. They, they just cut several things out so that they could go to Disney World and, uh, and actually enjoy it. And to me, who has a, an impulsive streak, three years is a long time uh, to sacrifice for maybe a week or two weeks of a, of a vacation. And, and so, like, I'm just saying that as an example, how looking ahead to something, hoping to see and experience will shape us. But it's not just a big family vacation like my buddy had. It can be a concert. It can be a family reunion. For crying out loud, it can just be a dinner out with friends on a Friday night. That thing on the horizon, that person, that reunion on the horizon sometimes gets us through a funk, doesn't it? We're, we're just kind of down. We feel like life is, you know, in, under a dark cloud or um, we're just spinning our wheels at work and we have nothing to look forward to. And all of a sudden, a friend invites us out. Hey, this Friday, can you guys get together? Ooh, you get a little pep in your step now. I have a fresh motivation to not give in right now, to not mope right now. I lift my eyes from the current uh, uh, circumstances to what's coming to me. And it just kind of causes our hearts to, to race and swell and hope again. Sometimes it literally gets us out of bed. I, guys, you, you know this about me. My son graduates on December 9th from basic training and I can't wait. I can't wait to go see him. And it doesn't surprise you that I think about it multiple times throughout the day. And it informs how I pray throughout the day. Lord, don't let him give up. Don't let him fail. Don't let him get injured. Let's make sure we have the money. Let's make sure I get somebody to, to do this and this and this because I'm going one way or another. That, that's just, just what I'm talking about. It's amazing. It's incredible how hoping to see can change present hope, present experiences, present behaviors. And we all know it's true. Seeing God, seeing God is the greatest joy we could ever imagine. I hope you know that. Seeing God is as good as it gets. Therefore, pursue purity of heart. Seeing Him affects us. See, the, the potential of seeing Him affects us, changes us. Therefore, pursue purity of heart. Looking forward to seeing God ought to be the great motivator of your life. It ought to be the one great glorious truth that shapes your heart above all other truths. For you and I, we were all made by God, made for God. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. The end of this bitter life, if we know Jesus, the end of this better, bitter life is eternal joy with the Lord. And that on the horizon 
affects us now. Now, don't get me wrong. I've never been. One day, perhaps I will. I assume Disney is awesome. And so is a movie night. And dinner out with friends. Concerts are pretty cool. But all of these individually, all of these collectively, pale in comparison to seeing our dear Lord one day. Like, I've got places I want to go while on earth. But I can't wait to see my Lord. To behold Him in His glory. And Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Well, Adam and Eve, all the way back in the garden, they fumbled the football. They fouled it up, didn't they? This is what was lost. The way back to God after Adam and Eve sinned against God, the way back was blocked by the angel with the flaming sword. You're not welcome to come back into this garden and see me anymore is what God was saying. And many years later, we looked at this briefly last week. Many years later, Moses is on the mountain and he has this great moment of intimacy but before the Lord where he's going back and forth. And he says, Lord, would you just show me your glory? Would you just let me see you, please? So that I'm not just speaking abstractly about this God who says I am who I am. But let me see you. And the Lord said back to Moses, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And that's the painful reality of life on earth. But then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son who is the image. The image of the invisible God. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature. In other words, God made a way for us to see his face and live. I think I'm the only one enjoying this right now. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? The Lord made a way for us to see his face and live. I hope your heart is getting like, this is such wonderful news. Jesus shows up. He is in this moment here on the Sermon on the Mount. He's seated. He's teaching his disciples. And he says this to them. This is how you can see God. Be pure in heart. Be pure in heart. I wonder, is anyone here bold enough to say, that's me? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jesus, you made it so plain. I'm glad I qualified. You see, when we, when we hear Jesus say this, we, we ought to feel a weight or uh, maybe even a degree of disappointment. I want to see you. Okay, be pure in heart. What? I mean, he might as well said, blessed are those that defy gravity, for they shall see God. Well, I'm out, and everyone's out, apart from God doing the impossible. And that's where we find ourselves. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to save the world. So what first feels like a disappointment, what feels like a crushing word, is proven in time to be a word of grace from God. This really is a gracious word. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Are you ready to see how this is a gracious word? I hope so. I hope you're leaning in. Let's think about the pursuit of purity in heart. As I said, this is the sixth beatitude, the sixth blessed attitude that Jesus pronounces a blessing on, the, the, the happy, the happy life. And in this moment, he says that happy life, that blessed life is realized in being pure in heart. And the first audience that Jesus was addressing would have immediately caught the significance of his word. He, he locates purity. He doesn't just say, blessed are the pure. He locates it somewhere that was radically significant. Like this would, have, this would have been deeply offensive to many. Not everyone, but to many. In heart. Not in hands. Not in clothing. Not in ceremony. Not in practice. Not in discipline. Purity in heart. The religious leaders prioritize clean hands, clean clothes, clean, clean traditions, clean ceremonies, clean vessels. They, they demanded that of others 
and judged and condemned others based on the degree of their clean hands. Well, listen to what Jesus would say later in the book of Matthew about those, those people that I was just describing, those Pharisees, those legalistic types that said you have to have the clean hands. This is in Matthew 23, 27. You can note it and go back and read it. It may surprise you to know our dear Lord speaks this way at times. But he does not begin with blessed. He begins with woe, terror, dread. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly, this is key, outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The religious community focused on purity of hands, the outward purity. But that wasn't just made up. It came from somewhere. In part, it came from the law of God, which, since, which spent so much time revealing these ceremonial uh, 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 rituals that they had to walk through to have to experience outward cleanliness to draw near to God. It came in part from that, but it also came in part from Psalm 24. What we read at the outset. Maybe you remember this. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands. They just should have kept reading. Because if they kept reading, they would have realized the one that can ascend the hill of the Lord, the one that can stand in the Lord's holy place, is he who has clean hands and a pure heart. But they missed it. Either they couldn't or they wouldn't acknowledge this. After 5.8, in just a few sentences, look at 5.20. Look at what Jesus says here in 520 of Matthew. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness, the purity that the Lord is calling for is beyond external outward righteousness and purity. Their, ex their righteousness was external. And he says, if you want to see me, if you want to inherit, you want to dwell in the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness has to exceed theirs. And he's saying not just external, but internal purity of heart. Purity of heart. In the Bible, the heart is, is um, the, the, the concise way of, of describing the true person, the secret person, the inner person. The heart is the well that all the knowledge and ambition, desire, motive, uh, everything flows out of the heart. Again, that's why I say it's the well. It, it's the control center for life. You know, like, like launching rockets out to space and con uh, control center or command, whatever it's called in Houston. Houston, we have a problem. That's the heart of the person here. And so to be pure in heart means to be clean to be spotless in our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Adrian Rogers translated 5.8 this way. Blessed is that which is unmixed. Blessed is that which is unmixed. So think of water that is pure. Unmixed. Having no chemicals. It's almost hard to imagine today, isn't it? Or maybe to take the next step, think of love. Pure love. There's an innocence to it. There's a, there's a no divided allegiance. There's no selfish motive. You don't care what you get in return. You purely, wholly, truly love that person or perhaps that thing. The word pure was most often used to speak of metals that uh, needed to be refined or those metals that had been refined over and over and over until all impurity was removed. So Jesus says that blessed life, that happy life is reserved for those whose hearts are unmixed, undivided in their love or allegiance to God. How few of us can say that's me. 
And are you troubled by the last sentence I just spoke? How few of us can say that? You should be troubled because it's not accurate. None of us can say that. In our natural heart, in who we are by nature, we're children of wrath like the rest of mankind, the Bible says. And it says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? That's why it's so incredibly dangerous to say, trust your heart. And I know you and I, as we've said that in the past, we've had good motives. And we're trying to find a way to say, probably, I think within the Christian circles, trust your heart means like, just trust that the Holy Spirit's working in you. The problem is the Bible says otherwise. And we ought to let our language be shaped by the scriptures. Don't say trust your heart. Say trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. We ought to read Matthew 5, 8. And feel a degree of disappointment. Goodness. That's not me, Jesus. Not that I want to see him. But I'm not pure in heart. Rather, I'm more like a chameleon. Y'all know those lizards that have that incredible way of just kind of blending in to their environment. So it's not a compliment many times to be called a chameleon. We put our mask on, don't we? We're keenly aware of the culture and the setting that we find ourselves in. And we put mask on to blend in. And so in one context, we know how to talk. And confess, we know the right degree of confession that makes us look right while, while, while never really dealing with the heart of the issue. We know when to sing, when to stand. Nobody told Pastor Mish to sit down today, but he sat down. He knows what to do. We love you. We know now's the time we say these wonderful things about the Lord. We nod our head and agree. But you know what we also know? When it's okay to be crude. I've told you one of the biggest surprises I've had. And I may injure you right now, but I'll trust the Lord will open this in your heart and give you grace. One of the biggest surprises I've had of being a Christian in Arizona is how often Christians cuss. I just can't get my mind around it. I don't understand it. It's acceptable. That is, we know when it's right to praise the Lord, but we also know when it's okay to cuss. We're chameleons. Uh, maybe another way is we're actors, actresses. And some of us are pretending, even this morning. And you may deceive me and your family and your church family. You may have us hoodwinked. But the Lord's not. He sees into our hearts, the essence, the secret person, the inner person. Some of us have been acting so long, we're confused. And we don't know whether or not we do truly love the Lord anymore. It's almost like a, like a, like a split personality. And we don't know which one the true us, the true self is. And so the Lord comes into that broken reality. And he says, I know you want to see me because that's written deep down into your soul. You're an image bearer. You want to see me be pure, unmixed, undivided in heart. I hope you hear me say this. I hope you can receive this. The Lord loves you. Every one of us, he loves you. You want to know what he's concerned about? His primary concern is not what you do. It's who you are. And don't get me wrong. What you do matters because it flows out of who you are. And so the Lord is looking at the heart. The Lord is judging the heart. Man comes along and looks at the outward appearance and judges. God's looking at the heart of the matter. That's why I say he cares about who you are. And I think we forget this. I think we miss this. I think, I think it's seen in how we teach the Bible so often and how we treat one another. Uh, and, and what I'm getting at is, is you just think about 
the role of judgment or guilt or shame or pressure into getting a certain outcome from people. If I just make you feel bad or embarrass you about something, maybe you will spring into action and act the right way right now. I wonder, is any parent guilty of forcing, demanding obedience out of kids? Every one of us have, right? While we neglect the heart. That is, we're looking at external conformity to our rules or external conformity for one another to God's ways, God's standards, while never ministering to the heart, shepherding the heart. And we do this even with the gospel of Jesus Christ, putting it out there and then demanding we act a certain way. But, but, but just think about this just for a moment. How absurd is it to look at a dead apple tree and say, now watch me work. Give me some green or red apples. I'll glue them or tape them on the tree. That's, that's dumb. I mean, it looks good for a moment, looks good from afar. But it's dead. No matter how many green apples or red apples we tape or glue to the tree, right? Our hearts are dead. Dead in sin. Until the Lord comes along by the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing us new life. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So think of it this way, if you will. Those, uh, the law of God, those, those demands of God, you know what they do? They wound, don't they? The gospel of God, that news of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and all that he accomplished, the law wounds, the gospel binds up. The law of God and all those demands that we make of people, they just expose. The gospel, the news of Jesus, covers. And so when we stand back and simply demand things from people, all we're doing is exposing how deficient they are without giving them any opportunity to actually make progress in the faith. If the law, the demands were sufficient, Jesus had no business coming. He could just demand things of us. But it's not sufficient to change us. It's, to, it's, it's sufficient to expose us. And we need that, that righteousness of Christ, that mercy of Christ, that, that the love of Christ to come and minister deep, deep, deep into our hearts. But not merely, um, not merely uh, uh, just like rubbing it in, but actually removing and replacing with a new heart. See, what I'm getting at is the Pharisees had a fine way of saying, y'all are impure. And we'd have to say, we agree. But Jesus came along and said, you're impure. And I'll die in your place. I'll suffer for your impurity. And I will give you a new heart. That by my righteousness and by my spirit's work can be pure. Standing before God, pure. Increasingly working it out in your life, pure. And so it is the fact that he demands this of us, that wounds us, that then as this plays out and he lays down his life, and we believe it, that he heals us. So then what are we to do? How do we fight for first personal purity? First is confession. Second is cleansing. Here's what I mean. We confess, that's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins, or to, uh, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, excuse me, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we confess, God, Matthew 5, 8 is not me. I am not pure in heart. And so like he did in these other Beatitudes, we need to mourn. We, we, we need to mourn the loss of our innocence, grieve and hate the sins that we have committed against God, the ones we hold dear in our heart. And as we confess these things to the Lord, the new covenant promises that Jesus purchased, that he fulfilled for us, they come to us with more than just an outward washing. He gives us new hearts. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Ezekiel 36, maybe you note this and you go back and read it in, 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 a, in a later time. But maybe the Lord would do this right now as I read this. You ready? Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. 
I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. In June of 1997, driving north on the interstate in my little uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse, that happened to me. And I'm standing here today because that happened to me. Did I perfectly live this out? Heavens, no. There's grace. But I went from stone heart to living heart. From dead in sin to alive in Christ. How I confess to God, I am a sinner and I am lost and I need you, God, because I'm not these things that I keep hearing about. Would you save me? And he did it and he gave me a new heart. My grace through faith in Christ. Do you need to be born again today? Do you read Matthew 5, 8 and say, I want to see God, but I don't have that pure heart. The answer is start with confessing it to God. Save me. Please, God, I don't want to be a chameleon ever again. I want to be who you saved me or who you made me to be. Save me to be that person today. May God do that work in us this morning. We confess and then we cleanse. And I'm taking that from James 4, 8. James 4, 8. James says, draw near to God. That's what that confession is in some manner. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Surely James was drawing on the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, if you want to read a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, if you want to know how early Christians interpreted, read, applied the Sermon on the Mount, go read the book of James. It is a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. So go read it sometime. He was surely leaning on Matthew 5, 8 when he said these words here. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. This, This is a call to show God that we trust God by putting an effort into personally being righteous. We actively work to experience clean hands and pure hearts. Not to earn our salvation, but to work out our salvation. For James also said, faith without works is dead. And so if you gather with us week by week by week, hearing the word of the Lord, with that first part of the good news of Jesus Christ, thinking, I am forgiven, I am righteous, I am saved, while I'm also not working out my salvation, you have been deceived. This is an active call. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means we've got to remove things from time to time. We've got to lay aside weight and sin which clings so closely. For some of us, we have subscriptions that we need to cancel. I don't know who you are, but I just know it's true. There are things in your home, on your phone, There are things that are competing for your heart that you just don't need. It may not be sinful to have it. It's just a weight. It's not helping you run with endurance. Cancel it. For others, it's laziness. We just have too much free time, and that leads our minds into impure thoughts, unholy ambitions. And so we need to replace the the downtime with Showing mercy to people, to serving the Lord, to giving all of our hearts to the Lord, all of our mind, soul, strength to the Lord. For others, you're the exact opposite. It's not that you have, no t- uh, you have so much time. You have no time. Your life is full of activities. And you have no time to grow in personal holiness. You work. And you come home from work to work. And my goodness, you dream about work and wake up and go to work. And you can talk about work and you can talk about all the goodness of it and all the misery of it. But you can't talk about the Lord. Or you can tell me the third string quarterback on your team. Or you could tell me the life principle that you read somewhere or heard somewhere. Or next year's plans. Or maybe it's 
Maybe it's the Christmas plans you have. You can read your resume of all that you've accomplished in this world. You can talk about your grandchildren. Sometimes ad nauseum. But they're yours, right? You're proud as a peacock. And I'm saying perhaps some of us have lost our first love. We have no time. And we're not growing. We're not being discipled and making disciples. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We confess and we cleanse. This pursuit of purity is by grace through faith. We receive it from Jesus. And by the Spirit's help, we show it to one another. That's what he's talking about. We've got to walk our way through these beatitudes of being poor in spirit and mourning. We've got to make that sequence to say, I need it because I don't have it. And then with this new heart now that he gives us, by the Spirit's enablement that He puts within us, we go and show it. And it's not miserable, you guys. How do I know it's not miserable? Because Jesus isn't miserable for crying out loud. And He's the one who spoke this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He tells us the reward for purity here. It's not miserable. He gives us a reward. Do you want to see God today? Do you, do you want to know Him? Do you want to be aware and know His presence? Be pure in heart. The literal wording of this, they shall see God, the literal wording is, they shall be continually seeing God for themselves. Woo! They shall be continually seeing God for themselves. Now, we've all met people in this world that talk about the Lord, that talk about Jesus, and it basically sounds like a second-hand witness. That is, as they're talking, you can, you can begin to detect, ah, they're kind of talking about things they've heard other people talk about. They're, they're telling stories that they've heard other people tell. Have you ever met people like that? This is getting real awkward, y'all. But we've also met people that almost immediately we knew that is not a second-hand witness. That man, that woman is not merely repeating a story that they heard. That man, that woman is telling a story that they experienced. That woman is telling me what she sees, not what rumor has it that she might see. Have we met people like that? That second group, that firsthand witness, they see God. They've experienced the richness and the glory that Jesus is talking about here of being uh, pure in heart. They shall see God. They know Jesus. They know Jesus, not just about Jesus. They know him personally and their life reflects it. This word see, see God has two meanings. And the, and the first one would be like to gaze upon, to, to behold, to fix your eyes on. To literally see. The, the second definition is, is more along the lines of perceive and experience. And Jesus is using it both ways. There is a day coming, brother, sister in Christ. There is a day coming when we will see him in all of his fullness. And we will not be consumed because we are sinners, but our hearts will race and sing with joy. What a day of rejoicing it will be on that great wedding feast of the Lamb where he comes in and we're there and we stand to welcome him and we say hallelujah to God be the glory. We will see him one day. And now we wait. But it's not miserable. It's not bitter to wait upon the Lord. To pursue, or, or to, to pursue the Lord by being pure in heart. Because now we perceive and we experience God in a way that those that are not pure in heart cannot even fathom. And you've had conversations where you're, you're like doting over Jesus. You're going on and on about how wonderful he is. And they look at you like you're a moron. You basically just said defy gravity. And they're like, that's absurd. And if you love them, your heart has ached. 
Because you want them to see what you see and know what you know, experience what you experience. And you also know without the Spirit's work in their heart, it's just not going to happen. And that leads you to pray for them. God, soften their hearts. Open their eyes. And that's my prayer for some of us. Soften hearts, Lord. Open eyes today, Lord, to see, to perceive, to experience you. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. John wrote, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes. So everyone who's hoping to see Jesus one day and be like Jesus one day. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 11, uh, uh, Hebrews 11.27 described Moses this way. And this describes the people of God today. As enduring as seeing him who is invisible. Is that your experience? Enduring as seeing him who is invisible. I had a moment one time. My life was in ruins. And I was on the second floor, like a church balcony, praying, and the Spirit of the Lord just, just came over me. And I don't remember how, but somehow I ended up flat on the ground, weeping tears of joy. And God was more real to me than the carpet that I was laying on. And somebody could have walked in and said, that guy's a madman. And I would have said, actually, no, I have all my wits about me right now. <laughs> because the Lord is with me. The Lord made himself known to me. And the Lord quieted my heart. And the Lord healed up that wound. And I'm okay. Because my eyes have seen the Lord now. And I hope if you haven't had that type of experience, that fullness of experience, that you have those moments where you just see him, you perceive him, you experience him, and you wonder, anybody else see this? Anybody else experiencing this right now? Because this is the Lord. Because we have a pure heart by his grace and for his glory, and we're, and we're not giving our hearts now to, to all these defiled things of the world. We're walking in purity. But you know what I know. Sin has a blinding effect, doesn't it? Even after we've truly been born again, sin blinds us so that we lack awareness of God. We lack awareness of his presence. We lack assurance of his love. We begin to doubt that, he, that he's real. We begin to doubt his love. We begin to doubt his word. We begin to doubt his mercy, his, his promises. And, and the problem is not by and large with us, how we see it. We say he's far from us. No, he's right there. It's just sin has blinded us. We've given ourselves to all sorts of impurities. Think about the hours, hours Christians spend on social media. For what reason? We wonder where God is. Think about the hours we watch news. We read about politics. We, we know all the stats. We know what our money market is doing. And we know what, I mean, we just, we know all of that. And we sit back and we begin to wonder, God, where are you? And we watch crude, crude programming. And we laugh at it. We're entertained by immorality now. Think about, think about how many TV shows. Think about this just for a moment. Think about how many TV shows, how many sitcoms, how many movies where dad is a moron. And we laugh at it, and then we come home and we treat our men that way. And we men, we just buy into it and we act like idiots. We've been discipled by the world, not by Christ. We laugh at it. We compound it by embracing it instead of the call of God to act like men. And if there were ever a time in our nation's history where the phrase that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians, act like men, meant something, it is now. When we have all this gender confusion. 
It means something to be a man. And I didn't plan on going there, but I'm just going to go there now just this morning in a way that I was not expecting. God gripped my heart for the men of this church. And my prayer was, would you make us holy men? That is, make us shade trees. That your daughters, God, can rest underneath. Make us oaks for Jesus' sake. That other people are blessed because of us. Men, you have things you need to let go of. You have distractions. You have ambitions. They need to be crucified. So that your heart can be free. So that your eyes can be opened to see God. What he's doing right here is he's, he's instructing us of how to, how to fight for, how to pursue purity. And it's basically saying, Jesus is basically saying, fight against lesser fleeting pleasures by fighting for the lasting eternal pleasure. Fight against all the fleeting pleasures of this world by fighting to see God. What's the motivation for canceling something? What's the motivation for crucifying that desire? I want to see you, Lord. I want to see you, Lord. And if, and if we can shape our week around the opportunity to have a date night, or shape our year by the opportunity to go on that dream vacation, or shape decades for the opportunity to retire, the greater joy is consuming us and we've shaped our lives to accomplish it, to achieve it, to enjoy it. He's saying, amen, so that you can see me. Don't fight against, fight for a sight of God. And those things that were once dear to you will not be dear anymore. Those things that had, had uh, claws in you will not claw you anymore. Because your heart is set on Jesus. But I'm aware of this. There are some of us in our church fellowship that uh, functionally are like a child holding on to the side of a swimming pool and um, holding on to the edge offers us a degree of security and we just can't, won't let go of the edge to swim with Jesus. Because we think somehow he's just, he's not going to measure up. Maybe it's just too good to be true. Um, he's going to disappoint me. I've worked my whole life, Eric, to get to this season of life. I ain't letting go of it, bud. Because I know Jesus is good, but what I have is pretty good. And I don't quite think he would match, let alone surpass, what I've accomplished. And I'm saying on behalf, brother, sister, or maybe friend, on behalf of the Lord and all of us that are swimming with him, you're just wrong. We see him. We know him. We're satisfied. And you can't imagine life for what we have. But we're here. We're living examples. It's okay. He's good. He really is. And as I said before, he's not miserable. He's blessed. He's living the blessed life. He sees God. He's not miserable. You know what he is? Free. And you won't find freedom holding on to the edge of the pool. You'll find freedom in Christ. And so the invitation of the Lord today is let go of whatever that thing is. Whatever's holding you back. Cleanse your heart. Confess to the Lord. Receive Christ. Trust Christ. See God. And be blessed.